And I did want to start by saying that in Beijing we watched your Vice President's lecture on webcast and he is truly an astonishing ambassador of this country. I, I probably shouldn't share with this audience one of the things that you said, which was that the nice thing about speaking to an academic audience was that no matter how outrageous what you say might be, there will always be at least one academic willing to agree. <laughs> Even our Chinese academic colleagues enjoyed that. Um, but Vice President, you're one of the few people in this room that's been Vice President. So could you start by telling us what has surprised you in becoming, like what, now that you can see the world as Vice President, what has been the biggest surprise? I think frankly the biggest surprise for me has been the shared impact of corruption on development. That's been the biggest surprise for me. I always thought it was a problem. But just looking at it, just comparing the size of uh, the corruption, the size especially of illicit financial flows, to what could have been achieved is for me an absolutely amazing. It was always absolutely amazing. And in, in your remarks, you said that you wanted to distinguish grand corruption and larceny from other kinds of corruption. <coughs> could you tell us about that? Just Explain that. The, well, the, the difference is, I mean, and it's a difference that I try to create because, again, there are different definitions of grand corruption. But grand corruption is in our context where, by executive approval, money is taken directly from the treasury and it's simply diverted to private uses. Now, that is one of the most shocking uh, type of corruption. Whereas, what we're more familiar with is corruption in the procurement process. You know, people taking percentages of procurements and all of those kinds of things. That's what we're more familiar with. Or simply stealing uh, from uh, resources that are already that are already in the hands of government agents and government agencies. But what is rare and what what is most damaging is directly going to the very source of revenues, where revenues is stored and, and without necessarily supporting, or without necessarily there being a contract or anything, simply moving resources. And is it your view that the government and the people in this room should focus on that corruption first and foremost, or do they need to focus on eradicating all kinds of corruption? No, no, I, I, I think that it is, first of all, to understand that this is that this is an issue and uh, to be able to say that this is unacceptable to call it out wherever we find it and I think for those of us who are involved in economic policy planning development planning and all that we have to understand that it exists we have to understand that this is it we really cannot speak of our economy as if we are speaking of the economy of Denmark just to draw again because and the economies of most other countries are not subject to the kinds uh, to, to this form of corruption. So I think that's very important. But everything else down the line is also important because, you know, just as I said, systemic corruption, corruption in the procurement process, corruption in approval processes, and getting pre-investment approvals and those kinds of things, obviously discourage investments. And so we must look at, at those. We must examine those uh, closely. But the problem where you have systemic corruption is how to deal with all of those issues at the same time. Because, I mean, because you, are, you are also dealing with a situation where the system is naturally fighting back. Well, let's ask the audience two questions. So the first question is, how many of you would be able to be more successful in your company, in your firm, in your agency, if there were less corruption in Nigeria. So hands up. Hands up those of you who would be more successful if there were less corruption. Okay, so lots of you don't have your hands up. 
I might have to pick on you to find out why it benefits you from being a <laughs> Or shall I try that question one last time? So, how many of you would be more successful if there were less corruption in Nigeria, if you lived in a corruption-free country? Okay, so I'm, I'm taking note of those who don't have their hands up for later, but, but now tell me, if you knew for certain that everyone else in this room was going to do something to fight corruption, so you knew that everyone else was going to do something, how many of you would do something to fight corruption? Hands up. Okay. Now, everyone who hasn't put their hand up, put their hand up now because it's important for your blood circulation. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, so, there are a lot of people in this room that want less corruption, and you perhaps more than, you know, as much, if not more than any of them. And I guess if we look across the world, even the grand corruption that you've talked about is increasingly looking possible to address. In Brazil, in Malaysia, we're seeing it exposed. But then if we look at the countries that have so sex successfully, quite quickly dealt with corruption. I mean, you know, I sit as Dean of the School of Government at Oxford University. And many, many countries come to us and say, well, it's deeply embedded in our, in our society, corruption. And so we give them examples of Singapore in 1959, which was said to be too corrupt to do much about, and in five years had transformed. Of, you, of Georgia, sitting next to Ukraine, two very corrupt countries, and Georgia's remarkable steps a decade ago. Of Kosovo, a small country that had the most corrupt and violent police force, who became, in a very short space of time, the most trusted institution in that country. And even in large countries, we heard about Indonesia, after the tsunami, $8 billion worth of aid went to Aceh, with virtually no corruption. So it, it seems to me that it, it's, it's absolutely possible. So what for you is the biggest obstacle for Nigeria? I, 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 think, I think years of impunity and years of no consequence, you know, has for, I think for very many, uh, we almost have come to accept it. You know, as uh, as just part of you know doing business. So for me, I think the major obstacle is is, is almost uh, it's almost uh, not really wanting to confront it too much and not really wanting to focus on it. So yeah, I mean, sometimes you find that people would rather not even uh, talk about it and try and you know look for some you know better way of approaching whatever the issue may be. So I think. Confronting it is, 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 is crucial because you really can't avoid it. And the only way to confront it on a consistent basis is, is for government to be determined, to be committed to it, especially strengthening the systems that will make uh, that, that, that will make corruption, you know, uh, con uh, con something that would attract some consequence, but not attract you know uh, sanctions. So if government is, is committed to it and committed and focused on an ongoing basis, then I, I think things will change. People really want to see, you know, and most people stand on the sidelines and say, well, let's see how this will go. Because there have been several you know, attempts to fight corruption. So there's, you know, a bit of a, a, bit of a fatigue also. So people need to see some, some results. In the, in the briefing note, which I think everybody has, and I'm sure is ready to be examined on, um, the, they lay out all the different institutions and laws that Nigerian governments have put in place to deal with corruption. So what, what for you is the most significant step that has already been taken? Is there a positive step? Now clearly we've got the laws, you've got the institutions, but they're not working as they ought. 
which must be frustrating. And I just wonder if you could share with us what so far is the most significant step that government has taken and what's your biggest frustration? I, I, think, the, I think the biggest step is holding those who have been, well, charging to court, arresting and charging to court, holding persons who have made their way with public funds, holding them accountable, taking them to court, seizing assets, you know, assets uh, both locally and internationally, the assets that have been transferred out of the country, the uh, proceeds of corruption, and, you know, at least ensuring that to a certain extent these individuals are brought to book. Now, the administration of justice process has been slow. The entire process of you know, trying individuals who are accused of corruption has been very slow. Now, that's, that's a different issue, of course, because the justice system has its own uh, delays, many of which are constitutional, many of which can be resolved, you know, perhaps without legislation, but some may require legislation. You know. And generally, you know, the attitude sometimes of counsel to engage in dietary tactics to keep cases on for as long as possible, so that perhaps ultimately there might be an exit, there might be a way out uh, for, for persons who have been accused of crime. But one thing we've seen, though, is that, for example, the first two convictions of, uh, of executives, of uh, governors who have been convicted of corruption, are almost uh, seven years, between seven and ten years old. I mean, in terms of the time it took to go through the process. But I think it does send a strong message that there is, if you like, the long arm of the law, the patient arm of the law, that even after seven years, even after ten years, the conviction is possible. But what we need is a much more efficient system, obviously, that is able to, to decide very quickly are you guilty or you're not guilty, and to take the appropriate steps. So, so practically, what does that mean to the people in the audience that want to watch out for whether that's likely to happen? Does it mean better protecting your judges, appointing different kinds of judges, creating a special judiciary procedure? What, what does that mean for you? So it means several things. Uh, if, uh, and we've been working on, on some of those initiatives. We, for example, obviously need to, to constantly watch the judiciary itself, you know, because again we're talking about systemic corruption, and it means that there is no institution that's not infected by, uh, by corruption. So we need to pay some attention also to judiciary and to judicial personnel to ensure that they are and remain persons of integrity. But more importantly, we need to we need to really interrogate the, the criminal process. You know, so past uh, an administration of justice act which has helped in some ways to remove some of the old obstacles to a smooth trial. In the past, uh, you could, if you're an accused person, accused of uh, corruption, you could ask for a stay of proceedings while you are challenging, uh, the, while you are challenging the charges. While you, you, know, you could say, well, I want the charges forged, I'm, I'm challenging the charges, so in the meantime, while I go all the way to the Supreme Court, which may take years, the criminal proceedings against me of the state. But under the new administration of justice, I will happen. You can't stay proceedings merely because you want to, merely because you want to appeal. So that has helped. Uh, that has helped a bit. There are also some strong judiciary, some judiciary stronger than others, you know, because of their experience. The judiciary in Lagos, for example, because it's a, you know much more commercially oriented. You know, has much more practice and all of that. It's a strong judiciary, and you see that many of the cases that go through that judiciary are much are disposed of much faster. You know, also because they have several changes have been made. The difficulty, of course, is that in many cases you have you know state judiciaries which are practically autonomous. So reform doesn't necessarily mean that you can reform every single state. You know, because federal government cannot reform the you know, uh, state judiciary. So we have to deal with that as well. But the appellate system is federal, you know, which means that if we reform the appellate system, at least you know, that's something that we're in some senses in control of. But the trial process is very important. And wherever the trial process takes place, you know, the 
delays that are inbuilt into those systems almost invariably uh, will play a part in determining whether or not it will be quick or not quick. But I think that our focus, and if you look at our new our national anti-corruption plan, one of the major focuses is on how we can reform uh, the judiciary, how we can change some of the uh, legislation that makes uh, cases, uh, that, 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 that slows down cases. In other parts of the world, like, you know, where you find that some of it is also, to a certain extent, self-regulation, where lawyers, you know, uh, are not allowed to do certain things, you know. We, we need to strengthen that as well. We need to strengthen the way that uh, uh, lawyers are disciplined, the whole disciplinary procedure for, for lawyers. So that a lawyer, for example, cannot engage in dilatory tactics willfully, and then there will be no consequence. So in any part of the world, you will lose your shirt for engaging in dilatory tactics in other places where you know the disciplinary system is, 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 is much firmer. You know, so we need to look at that. We need to look at uh, that. Level. So there, there are you know, several issues. But so you're, you're pointing, on the one hand, to the need to further refine the process and tighten up the process. But the other part of what you're saying is this is about people. This is about getting the right people. And I remember the finance minister of Indonesia, Sri Mulyani, first time she was finance minister, came to Oxford to talk about her fight against corruption. And she said across the senior public service in her country, in Indonesia, that she had to quite quickly identify three groups of people. There were the 10 or 20 percent who were not corrupt, who would support her agenda. There were the 10 to 20 percent who were absolutely entrenchedly corrupt and who were never going to come along. And then there were the sort of 60 to 80 percent of people in the middle who could be co-opted if they believed the whole system would be clean and not corrupt, they would back that, but if the system was corrupt, they too would be corrupt. Does that resonate with you? Do you think that, could you say the same about Nigeria? Yeah. I, I, I think the vast majority of people would rather work in an environment that was free of corruption, because really most people do not benefit from corruption. I think the only fraction, a small fraction, would benefit anyone. Most people are victims of corruption. So I think the vast majority. But the, the issue, of course, is the powerlessness of that majority, aside from you know the indignation and the outrage and the complaining, you know, the powerlessness of that of that. Uh, so I, I think that however small the the numbers may be of those who are determined to to fight corruption, especially within the government. And of course, the political will at the very top you know, is crucial. You know, however small that number may be, I'm, I'm certain that we, 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 that great change can be made because the vast majority of people will support that change. You know. But again, you know, we are confronted with another fraction. I'm not entirely certain of what percentage that will be who are benefiting from it, either systemically or benefiting, benefiting from it by virtue of the fact that they are connected with persons within the system. And they are the only two who will be this. But in our, in, our, in our situation, corrupt, uh, the corrupt are very well resourced on account of the fact that they have, over time, built up, as it were, you know, uh, a war test. So, I mean, it, it, it could, in that sense, be, be, be a considerable task. And how, how do we move? So, uh, part of what you've said so far is that this is about politics and business at the very top of the system, something which most people can't really touch. And that that part of the system needs change. In the, in the, in the school of government, you know, we, we kind of define what that needs to look like positively where you need senior officials and senior business leaders who have three qualities. They must have a public service vision. They're prepared to sacrifice their own interests for the interests of the country. They've got to have integrity and a, and a willingness to call out corruption and not act corruptly. And they've got to be 
competent, which usually means humble about what they don't know and able to ask for help when they don't know. So if that's, if that's where we need to ensure that the leadership across Nigeria's government and private sector is, what to you are some of the ways to get there? Hmm. Well, <laughs> let, me say, let me say first that um, that combination of which you speak is a rare one. Hmm. Where you find, uh, you, you very frequently find persons of integrity who lack the courage to call out corruption. And that is probably, or who maybe not necessarily lack the courage, but just don't want to get themselves involved in any kind of confrontation you know, with corruption. So, by and large, I think that what people need the most and what government can provide is, a, is the kind of support that lets people know that the highest, the, the highest echelons of governments are behind the anti-corruption fight so that if you participate in it, you have the full support of, you know, of the highest levels of government. I think that that will bring in, you know, many who, I mean, of course, those who combine the three attributes that you've spoken of, you know, and I, I believe they're, they're probably a very small number, but many who would rather sit on the fence can easily be co-opted where they find that government is committed and that government will see it through. You know, so many, so so many times, people, I think, want to see and see. Uh, will it? Uh, are these people serious? Will they keep this fight on, or am I just going to be out on a limb? You know, if if, if if I support this in any way. So I think that's you know part of uh, part of. So can we turn to what this room can do to actually help government do that? A year ago. Um, in the World Economic Forum, I was with a group of South African CEOs and business leaders. Obviously, South Africa is confronting serious corruption scandals of its own. And in a, in a private, very rich discussion, one of the things that came out was that the private sector leaders were afraid to stand up and call out corruption in government. Because when they did, none of their colleagues stood up with them. And they agreed in that room that that's one of the things that they needed to do. When one private sector CEO stood up to say, this, this process is corrupt, it was absolutely vital that everybody else in the room stood up and said yes, rather than leaving them hanging out to try. But I, I, I wonder, that's just a reflection from a similar group in South Africa, but... What would you want to ask this room to do to support government to fight the kind of corruption that you're saying is most toxic? I think, I think the most important thing is, is to have some kind of critical mass of individuals in the private sector and public sector who are committed to the same ideals, especially as, uh, as regards corruption. And, and frankly, I don't think it requires everyone. I think it requires a handful, a few people who are prepared to you know, join forces with those who want to fight corruption. And, and I must say that there is a good number of people who have worked, who, have, who continue to work with them to ensure that we are able to clean, uh, to, to clean the system. But obviously we need many more people who are prepared to come forward and say, you know, I'm prepared to be a part of this. You know, and, 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 and really, the, the, for, for many, and if you look at business generally, I, mean, I, I think business people, their, their major concern is that I just don't want to rock any boats. I don't, you know, who knows what will happen in another five, six years, you know. I've seen all sorts, you know. So I think what is required is for them to see that, you know, first of all, that this is important for all of us, and that down the line, you know, if we don't sort this out, uh, as uh, President always says, if we don't kill corruption, corruption will kill us. And that is in our self-interest to, to, to fight corruption. You know, as you said, a lot of people, just a lot of business leaders, just don't want to rock the boat. I can see some, some nodding in the audience. So practically, what is it that you 
in government need these people to do? If you could ask them to commit to one particular thing or to take a particular action, you know, presumably you're not saying jump out of the boat or rock it on your own, but what, what would you ask them to do? Um, I think it would be to support what, uh, to support the anti-corruption, uh, to support anti-corruption, to, and, and basically what that means, uh, well, for now, is in whatever ways, in whatever ways you can, you know, we, we put out uh, quite a few things, in whatever way you can, lend your support, lend your support to it, and, and really, uh, part of it is, is, is not necessarily in seeking convictions, is in the reforms that, were, that, that are being made in, in administrative processes, the reforms we are making in you know, the procurement processes, in what ways can you be a part of that, of helping in that reform process. Because I think that for many people, uh, the, the confrontational aspects, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily believe that it is fair. We in government can deal with a lot of the confrontational aspects, that's why we're in government. But I think the parts of it, especially in improving government procedures, improving procurement procedures, and being able, through some whistleblower, through our whistleblower schemes, to call out senior uh, officials of government and all of that, who are doing something wrong. And I think even just using that anonymous process is, is useful, because practically every big, uh, every CEO would probably have confronted someone who is senior enough in government or, some, or in some agency who may uh, be stepping out of line. And I think it's possible to call them out, not necessarily openly, but uh, through, you know, uh, uh, with any of our whistleblower procedures. So that's possible. But I think most importantly is in what ways, for example, that the NDS work with us on refining many of the, you know, procurement processes, uh, pre-investment approvals, the CAC and the various uh, government, uh, uh, the, the various government processes that are so open uh, to corruption. And of course there's also, I mean something that I admire greatly watching Nigeria is the involvement of, you know, some of your business leaders, I know Aiki Mukwede and, and, and working with your head of service and other business people trying to really help and trying to inject some of the know-how from the private sector into the public service to help in that transition. Um, is there more that the private sector could be doing on that larger purpose? I mean, the, you know, in China, one of the vice ministers in charge of public officials was saying to me, look, we do have a problem in this very large country of China which is that many of our public officials are so low paid that they can't really survive without corruption. And they are corrupt. And thirdly, they're not responsive to the public. They're seen as the public as just corrupt and incompetent. So we can't change any one of those without changing all three. You know, you've got to do something about pay at the same time as doing something about corruption, at the same time as doing something about performance, and that's that's hard. My colleague Paul Collier likes to talk about countries in which the government pretends to pay people who pretend to work. You know, it's a kind of public service problem. Are there other things that this this group could do? Do you think to help in the process of taking Nigeria's public service back to what it used to be? Again, you know, I think the parents of many people in this room, and again, this is something that Aki Mokwede said at, at Oxford a couple of years ago, he said, our parents were proud to serve in the Nigerian government. Our, that was the highest aspiration after independence for each Nigerian. It was to serve the country by serving in the public service. How do we get back to them? Mm. I, think it's a, I think the challenge really is not just um, one of pay. I think it's also one of reorientation, you know, values and all of that. But pay is, of course, crucial. I think was, you know, we might describe as reasonably successful is one which we carried out in Lagos, the Lagos State Judiciary Reform, 
And um, that reform involved you know, several aspects. In, in 1999, we, we did a survey, and that's in Lagos State, we did a survey of the judiciary. We, we interviewed a hundred legal practitioners who practice regular legal courts. And we asked the question, do you consider the judiciary, you know, the, the Lagos judiciary, corrupt, very corrupt, notoriously corrupt, fair and unjust, etc. And 89% said that the judiciary was notoriously corrupt. 89% of lawyers who practiced in the courts. Now, question was, how do we deal with this? In that period, in the period between the, 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 the founding of the state and 1999, not a single judge had lost his job, or a single magistrate had lost his job. So everybody knew that there was a problem, but there was no, no addressing it. So we then decided, you know, with the judges, actually sat with the judges, the remuneration, of course, was very, very poor, extremely poor. And we looked at, you know, the remuneration, very clear. I met with six of the most senior judges at the time. They looked at their remuneration. And we, we asked us the questions, okay, so you have three kids in school, this is how much it will cost. You know, after a while, it was obvious to all of us around the table that none of them could survive, you know, with the kind of you know lives that they were expected to live as judges and all of that on the on the salaries. So we decided that that, that compensation was an important issue and we're going to deal with it. Second issue was discipline and how to ensure discipline. Third issue was the quality of individuals who were appointed. Now, fortunately for us, we had control over practically all of that. So we reviewed the remuneration, you know, and uh, one of the chief concerns of persons in the public service is that when they retire, would I have a home to go to? So we ensure that each judge will provide with a house. The day you are appointed, we'll give you a house, we'll give you a, you know, a house in a, in a nice uh, part of town. And uh, we also, of course, take care of every other thing. And then we move the salaries up considerably. We started with a 300% increase in salary, and then we sort of indexed it. As a matter of fact, we had a, we had a human resource person take a look at the salaries for us. And we ensured that we benchmarked our salaries against states that we thought were doing very well, so that the government were able to review the salaries. So many were satisfied, reasonably really satisfied with the salary. Then the other part of it was getting the right people. So we started the process of actually examining judges. In the past, judges were never tested. They were never questioned. So it was basically on um, the basis of who you knew and all that. So we started a whole system of examination for potential judges and interviews, you know, which helped a great deal in getting a good crop of, of judges in. Again, fortunately for us, almost half uh, the judiciary was retiring you know, in that period. So we were able to appoint 26 new judges to 52, you know, uh, to 52 spaces. So we were able to take a new crop of half 26 new judges. But the other thing was consequence when there was corruption. We, we had to uh, sack 21 magistrates, you know, for corrupt activities and all of that. And three others, three judges, also lost their jobs. So when it became obvious that there will be consequences for corruption, you know, people sat up. We did the same survey, this time with the World Bank, in 2007. And as far as the High Court of Lagos was concerned, we were now recording 0% of those who felt that the judiciary was corrupt, from 89%. The High Court, not uh, the, the High Court judges, zero percent. So really, I mean, it's not on account of the fact that these individuals, you know, suddenly, you know, became uh, born again. <laughs> it's more on account of the fact that, yes, they're better paid. Secondly, there is consequence for, for their actions. And the appointment process is one that introduces some merit and some rigor. So it's not just, you know, who you know. So I think you're absolutely right that in reforming the system, but of course it's much more difficult when you're reforming the entire civil service system. Today we're spending almost 70% on salaries and overheads for civil servants and the pay is still not good. You know, so the question of course is how much more, you know, 
maintaining the numbers that we have today. You know, there are those who you know, offer all sorts of ideas on what to do, you know, how to uh, possibly downsize and all that. But again, we're confronted with a situation where the economy simply isn't strong enough to have you laying people off and all that. So there are hard choices uh, to be made. But there's no question at all that you need to reform the system, you need to pay better, you need to train better, and then the process of even coming on board needs to be much more merit driven. So, so there are places in Nigeria where this is happening, and yet it seems hard to do everywhere. I mean, I, I don't want to lure you into saying things that you shouldn't say, but except that I do. You know. <laughs> What happens when you try to dismiss someone who's corrupt? Like, who is it that courts you? Who is it that puts pressure on you not to do that? <laughs> well, let me, let me say that we have, you know, uh, I, I, I always like to refer to the Nigerian elite, and probably not fair to that in broad, but practically every segment, you know, because, you know, people who have access to it could be political leaders, it could be religious leaders, business leaders, whoever has access, you know. So we, so we have a system where people just feel that, well, we can, you know, let's, uh, why, why don't you just give this guy a break? You know, it's not, uh, and I don't think that people necessarily feel that there's anything wrong with that, you know, which again is, is part of the problem. So you don't get one call, you get several calls. <laughs> Come from anyone in this room. Um, but, but it does, it is very striking. I mean, I've been spending a lot of time in Brazil over the last year. The corruption scandal has, has crept across, and so many Brazilians who don't want their government or their, or their uh, economy to be corrupt nevertheless say, talk about how they just all got soaked into it, that it's so difficult. You know, if the system is corrupt, it's just very difficult to actually play within it. And it took a kind of massive um, judge-led uh, breaking of that system, which is proving very politically traumatic for them. Um, so, I think thus far in the conversation, it's clear that this is a conversation which involves everybody in this room. And so, but just before we, we close, I'd love to take a couple of comments or questions from you. Just a couple of, is, is there anyone, brave person, who's got a question or a comment? So right here at the front, let's take a... I think it's fair to say that it's an obstacle course. Trying to get money from foreign governments or foreign banks is an obstacle course. It is laden with all manner of difficulties. Of, I mean, it, it's obvious that there is no great enthusiasm about returning money that is already in, in, in their custom. Very obvious. And this is and this is whether or not, you know, and well, whatever the rhetoric is, it's very obvious that the system, the systems in many of the, of, the, of these countries simply <coughs> is not in any hurry uh, to, to, to return money. Of course, what people would say is that there's a judicial system we have to contend with. Yeah. But it's also obvious that that same system, the same systems, when money related to corruption, money related to terrorism, and all of that was found in their systems, or drug money, uh, they, they were very quickly confiscated. Very quickly confiscated. As a matter of fact, in, in, in the 90s, when drug money was all over the place, we signed all manner of mutual legal assistance treaties, conventions of every kind. And immediately after 9-11, you know, the, the terrorist financing and all of that was under close scrutiny. As a matter of fact, it is, in my view, only by virtue of the fact that terrorist financing came into focus, that the proceeds of corruption also came into focus. No one was prepared in the late 90s you know, especially OECD countries, none of them was prepared at that time to consider the proceeds of corruption as dirty money which ought to be confiscated and returned to the countries from where they came. So there's a great deal of reluctance. There's a great deal of reluctance. No question at all. And so we have to simply fight through those systems. 
go through the courts, you know, engage the governments and all of that. But um, it's not, no one has heard of it. No one has heard of it. So, you know, some moves in the international system are being made. Um, but I, but I think that the, the question is so apt. I mean, if we think about the scandal that Malaysia is embroiled in, the role of America's largest investment bank has been in creating one MDB and taking an $800 million fee for creating what was, in effect, massive larceny. But it's, in, it's now embroiling other countries. Prime Minister Mahathir you know, has been very vocal about what he sees as China's involvement in, you know, creating loans which hid some of the corruption and so forth. Um, I think the, the, the United Kingdom and European governments and the United States banking system have all been collus collusive. Um, but there, are, there is change afoot, I think, across the international system and that could support Nigeria. And I guess the question... Um, to the Vice President as a, as a closing question might be what do you most want the international community to do? What do you most want regulators and governments in other countries to do in order to support Nigeria on this issue? I, 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 think, I think really it is just to see stolen funds for what they are. To see first of all that they are first it's a crime and once you're able to prove uh, prima facie that this is stolen funds, it should be repatriated to the government. There, there, there shouldn't be any, there shouldn't be any great process and all of that. I think that sometimes, you know, we, we invariably get caught up in arguments that are clearly not necessary because, you know, in, in many parts of the world, I mean, terrorist funds are confiscated and nobody really is allowed to go to court and start asking us some funny questions and all that. I think that we should just, there should just be a firmer attitude, uh, to, especially from the point of view of government. And I do understand that there may be uh, legal processes. And the second thing is to hold banks to account. You know, many of the banking, many of the banking institutions are regulated by, you know, uh, by, not just by, by uh, agencies of government that are able to say when you've done something wrong, when, you, when there's been some malfeasance and all that, they're able to hold them to account domestically. But many of those institutions don't say a word where uh, this involves proceeds of corruption or funds from foreign countries. So I think expanding their jurisdiction to be able to speak up where those things happen or to be able to sanction institutions where those things happen. I think we just need a greater deal of, uh, a greater amount of cooperation between governments and their institutions and ourselves. At the moment, you know, that's a very, the relationship is almost, you know, uh, it's just a sort of relationship that you can't, you, you really can't say they're working with us or they're not working with us, you know, where basically, just uh, not just as good as a week sometimes. No, I'm not entirely there. I think we need, I think we need to see just much more commitment to this whole uh, fight against uh, 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 illicit transfers. And all that. I think we just need to see a bit more commitment on the part of foreign countries. Thank you very much. So I would take three takeaways from this discussion, and I'm so sorry, we're, we're out of time. Three quick, quick takeaways. One is the need to address impunity at the very top of the system. And that, that, that all of you as leaders in this country need to support doing that, that it's difficult, that those telephone calls do come in to prevent that. Um, and you can be part of changing that by, by actually making a telephone call of a different kind to support the politicians that are trying to address impunity at the very top of the system. And that's the Vice President's point about starting with grand larceny. I think the second point that you've really highlighted for us is that it doesn't have to be everybody. It takes a critical mass. And that's what's happened in other countries, whether it's Malaysia or Brazil or Indonesia 
or the countries that I cited, Georgia, Singapore, in all of those countries, it was a critical mass of people willing to stand together. And that means private sector leaders standing together as well. And I think the third takeaway is how, how possible it is, the Lagos judiciary example, that determined action followed through can create beacons that actually work efficiently and that you don't have to be helpless in the face of a corrupt system. You can take parts of the system, clean them up and move on to the next. So, Mr. Your Excellency, Mr. Vice President, Professor Yemi Osimbajo, on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to say a huge thank you for such a frank discussion. Thank you.